coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me set a little bit of a historical context of, of where we're at in this passage. Imagine many, 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 many years ago, Jesus Christ himself is walking on the face of this earth. He's got his 12 disciples with him. The miracles are taking place. People are, are following him. People are being converted, but there are those that are standing against him. There's those that are, are rejecting him, and they're questioning him. And the day is coming that the, the fulfillment of his entire purpose of being on the face of the earth is going to come to a point. And this is where we're at in this particular passage. Uh, we know that, that Jesus it was coming up on the Passover meal, and that's the annual, the annual sacrifice, the annual meal that the, the Jewish people would observe. And he told two of his disciples, he said, go before, and, and you'll go down into the city, and you'll find a place, and you'll, you'll set up the Passover meal. And they did. But we, we, we also know the story of the, of the disciple that betrayed our Lord. And we know that this has taken place and, and, and Jesus is here at the table at the final Passover, and he done something completely out of context. He done something that was not expected. He done something to the to the religious laws of man that was forbidden, because he astrayed from what they knew as the Passover meal, and he instituted the Lord's Supper. He instituted holy communion. And if you've looked at the bulletin, if you're familiar with, the, with what the table before us represents, we will be observing the Lord's Supper this morning. But I wanted to take a few moments during the message and really expound on exactly what the Lord's Supper is. The meaning behind it. And everything that, that God done that day through His Son. Communion is an act of worship. From the belief. Communion is us memorializing the death of our Savior. Remembering exactly the price that was paid for you and I to be able to experience freedom. Eternal freedom. In the confines of a glorious heaven. It's a it, it to the outside world can be a little confusing. Because for somebody that don't know Christ, for somebody that don't understand Christ, it looks like we stand around in a somber tone and we pass out this little bite of bread and we, we take a drink of a little bit of grape juice. And some people get emotional. Some people hide their emotions, but it stirs the bosom and they walk out the back door. And to the world, the, the purpose of the communion is not understood. But to you and I as a church, to those that know Christ as their Savior, the purpose of communion is profound. And it is not only important, it is needed within our lives. And Jesus himself left the church with a couple ordinances. The first ordinance he told us to follow him in believers' baptism. After you receive Christ as your Savior, after you ask him to come into your heart to save you from your sins, if you repent and you turn to him, we are to baptize you. And you are to follow him by believers' baptism. But the other ordinance he gave us was observance of the Lord's Supper. So if you will, read with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to start in verse 23 and we'll read through the end of the chapter. Remember, they're at the table. Jesus begins to, to veer from the standard Passover meal. And he says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and, that, and drink of that cup. 
For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But if when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. The Lord's Supper was instituted that night at the last Passover meal. Jesus Christ's time of fulfillment had come. And Jesus knew that. I want to look at three things concerning this message. First, I want us to see what the message was that Jesus had for the disciples. I want us to understand exactly what his message was for us to hear today concerning this ceremony that we will observe in a few minutes. You see, up until that point, salvation and, and the, the, sins, the sins were handled by blood sacrifices, by, by the priest making atonement in the temple. And, and up until that point, that they would come together and they would bring the, the best that they had and they would bring their goats and their sheep and the, the acceptable animals for sacrifice and they would offer them as a burnt offering or as a blood offering before the Lord. And the high priest will take care of that for them. But there had come a time where we learn in this passage, in the 25th verse, that there was a new covenant coming into play. And what was that new covenant? The new covenant was a sacrifice that is beyond all sacrifices. It was not just a sacrifice that is beyond all sacrifice. It was a sacrifice that would suffice any further sacrifice. It was our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who came to this earth that took on the body of man, took on the flesh of man, lived as man, rejected sin, rejected the temptations of the devil. He, he lived as a man, but yet he sinned not. And when it comes to the day that he knew he'd be laying his life down on the cross, he made a new covenant with the world. He made a new covenant with you. He made a new covenant with I that no longer would blood have to be shed for the remission of sin. Why? Because his blood was shed for the remission of sin. He wanted them to understand that the bread that he was using was a symbol of his body that he was allowed to be broken. He wanted them to understand that the, that the cup, the drinking, would be a, a symbol of his blood that he would shed. And that nobody could receive salvation without the blood of Jesus. And we sung the songs today and they were focused around the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Not your money. Not your good deeds, not prayers from anybody else, but it's the blood of Jesus that can wash away your sin. It's the blood of Jesus that gives you your salvation. And that is the whole point of the message of the Lord's Supper. It's a message to those that don't understand that the sin was paid for because Christ allowed himself to be broken. It was paid for because he shed his blood and every last drop of it, I believe, for you and for I. And he sat there at that table last night and he told his disciples, this is the bread. And he broke it. And he said, this is my blood. And I'm giving it to you. There was a new covenant. Christ himself became the sacrifice. The old covenant had walked or washed away. It was not needed any longer. Sin was still a part of the world. Sin is still a part of the world today. And, and we allow sin to come into our life. And if we've never trusted Christ as our Savior, the Bible tells us that we are as lost sheep. But he, we're not in his flock. We're not in his family. But he died and he paid the price for us to be there. And all you have to do today is you're struggling with that. If you don't know that you're, that you're saved, if you don't know that you have eternal security, that you're going to spend eternity in heaven, Jesus died for you. His body has been broken and His blood has been shed. And we're going to remember that today, but this may be your day to come to know Him. And He told you that this, today could be your day of salvation. That all you have to do is pray and confess with your mouth and believe in your heart 
And that is a true repentance and a turning of your sin. And thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. From the poorest of the poor to the richest of the rich. It don't matter. He died for you. Nationality, we put up we put a lot of emphasis today for some reason on nationalities and ethnicities. It don't matter. I hate to break it to you, Americans, but we weren't the first people on earth. We weren't. It don't matter. He dies for all mankind. I hate to break it to us, Americans, but we're not the best people on earth either. We're just sinners like every other soul that's ever lived. If you love us enough, he commended his love toward us, he allowed his son to come and die on the cross. Had his body broken and his blood shed. And he sealed it for all eternity. That if you will accept him, and if you will believe Jesus, you are in the family of God. That's the message of this ordinance. But what is the purpose of the ordinance? What does the Lord's Supper mean to us? First, it allows us to go back and remember what happened. Sometimes we need to be reminded. Sometimes we get kind of high and mighty on we don't mean to. Yesterday I enjoyed being able to participate in the American Legion Oratory Contest. It was good to sit there and be reminded by the young people of the principles and the foundation that our little country was founded on. Christians, sometimes we need to be reminded <coughs> of what Christianity is all about. And without the broken blood or the broken body and the shed blood of Christ. Why would we even be here? We would. And, and this ordinance allows us to look at 23 through 25. It talks about Jesus being betrayed with broken body and shed blood. It allows us to know and to be reminded what I don't want to bring emotions into it. But Christian, if you don't get emotional during the Lord's Supper, you need to look at your heart. I don't care if you shed a tear. I don't care if you cry. That ain't emotion. It's in the heart. But when you take that little bite of bread, <coughs> when you drink that little cup, do you understand what we're doing? If you remember what it was that our Savior paid for, You'll understand the purpose of communion. Some people observe communion every time they go to church. Good for them. Nothing wrong with that. I've had people ask me, well, how often are you supposed to, to observe it? The Bible says as often as you do, do and remember to me. It would be perfectly fine if we got together every hour of every day and observe communion. What we've got to guard and what we've got to be careful of is it don't become a ritual. We be careful that it don't become something that we have to do because that's what we're supposed to do. We here observe every three months and every special time in between. The purpose is to remind us of what Christ paid for you and I. The purpose is also to allow us to, to proclaim our faith and how efficient his life was. And how efficient his death on the cross was. And to give back to him in return. I don't know about you all, but when my heart's right and I walk out of communion, I not only understand what the purpose is, but I understand how important he is. And there's a renewed sense in my heart that wants to drive me forward right, to continue to serve him. That's what we're doing this morning. That's the second purpose. The third purpose is to give us a, a sense of fellowship in the body of Christ. 
And, and, and we remember the churches that if we should be a united group. We don't need to be split apart. We don't need to be divided. We need to be unified because there's only one God and there's only one purpose and there's only one message and there's only one salvation. And when we gather here as believers and we partake of the Lord's Supper, one of the one of the things I enjoy is we serve everybody and as a unified group of believers, we partake of the bread at the same time. As a unified group of believers, we partake of the of the symbolic blood at the same time. We sing at the same time, we pray at the same time, and we walk out at the same time to serve our God. So it also serves as a purpose of reinforcing fellowship among the church. Jesus' death shows us how much it was that God loves us. How important His Son was as He hung on the cross of Calvary. That's the only way our sins can be forgiven. It's the only way that we can know eternal life. This is good news for us, Christians. We should be emotional. But the Lord's Supper should also instill a sense of joy. Because there's some of us here today that feel forgotten. There's some of us here today that are struggling in one aspect of life, some way or another. There's some people here today among us in this small group of people that are struggling in life and they feel like they're abandoned to Jesus Christ. He broke his body and he shed his blood not for Lakewood, not for Tennessee, not for America, not for the world. He shed it for you as an individual. And you can partake if you know him as your father. You can partake if you if you are found worthy and you can be Reinstilled with the joy that Christ desires for you to have because you understand exactly how much you are loved and how much you are supported. That's another purpose of the Lord's Supper. Jesus said himself to the disciples concerning the motions in John chapter 16 and verse 20. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto ye, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. You shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Jesus told his disciples that, knowing that the world would cry out, Release Barabbas! Release Barabbas! Crucify him! And those, those small group of followers that were following Christ and submitting to Christ, they would weep and they would lament. But Jesus said himself, don't worry when the world turns on me. Don't worry when the world turns on you because I will turn your sorrow into joy. That's another purpose of the Lord's suffering this morning. You start to see how important this ordinance is to the church. How important it is for me and you. You see, we as a church, we look backwards to the, to the crucifixion. We look backwards to the point where he hung and he was beaten and he, he bled and he died for us. We, we look backwards to the, to the point of the resurrection where he, he defeated death and he rose from the grave. And, and, and we know that that was a, an absolute defining moment of all of history. But it's also the day that we're able to just escape death. That was the day that we can escape slavery. It's a day that we were made able to escape the sin weight of this world. That was a joyous day. Even Christ himself said, for the joy of the cross. I endured it for the joy that was set before. Christian, allow your hope to be reinstilled. The last purpose is the Lord's Supper also defines our personal relationship with Christ and God. We continue to participate in the death of Christ. Why? Because He told us as followers to do what? To 
take up our cross and follow. Follow. We participate not only in his death, but we participate in his life. We'll observe the broken body. We'll observe the shed blood. The Christian allow that to remind you that he done all that for you. He also done it for the people around us. And while we take up our cross and follow him, we have been given the responsibility we have been given the awesome responsibility of sharing that message with the world around us. How will they know if we don't tell them? The media is preaching the gospel of Christ. I'll use Billy Graham as an example. He got a lot of attention by the media, but did he ever get or did his message get any attention in his death? very little. They would talk about America's preacher passing away. They would get on there and they would say there'll never be another preacher like Billy Graham. You hear what they're telling? You hear what the world is saying? They're saying this great preacher died but there'll never be another one like him. Hope is gone. How many times did you hear the news talk about The time he told people, if you don't repent of your sins, you're going to hell. But you don't have to go to hell because Jesus Christ died for you because he loved you and all you have to do. That wasn't on there, was it? But yet, for all the years of his ministry, what was one thing Billy Graham was known to preach? The gospel of Christ. Go back. Pull up some of his manuscripts and read his message. He was not a simple-minded man, but he had a simple-minded message. He stood firm. Same message we're tasked to give to the world today. About community to reinstill where we're at in our personal relationship. And the last thing I want to look at is the order of community. The order of this service. First, you have to be saved. Some churches hold what in the Bible school they teach you to be closed with communion. There's nothing in the Bible that promotes that. We don't do it here. We never will. And as far as I'm concerned, I'll never be a part of it. Because we don't have a communion service in the Lord's Supper for only members of Lakewood Baptist Church. That's not what the Bible teaches. For the Bible does teach very clearly that it is for all of those who know Him as a Savior. It teaches that if you repented of your sins, you understand that He's the way of salvation, you could accept Him as your Savior, and that's the first step to being able to participate in the Lord's Supper. The church, a lot of churches stop right there. There's more to the requirement than that. It also says under the order that you are to take part in a worthy manner. A worthy manner. That we are not to take part in a manner unworthy of Christ's suffering. Verse number 27 of chapter 11. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink the cup of the Lord unworthy shall be guilty of the body of the blood of the Lord. Christian, what this is saying is there should be no unrepented sin in your life. That you should take time to examine not your outward appearance and not your actions or your words or any of that, but you should also examine the inward heart that only God and you know about. There's none of us worthy. There's none of us that will ever be worthy. But boy, will we call them throne of grace before our Lord and we give it all to Him and we surrender and we repent, Christ makes us worthy. And sometimes we, we fail at doing that daily. We fail at regenerating ourselves, so to speak. And the Lord's Supper instills an opportunity for us to be recalled to the point of forgiveness. Each one should put ourselves 
to the test. Test your attitude. Test your heart. Test the inward nature of your life. And understand what the true purpose of communion is. And find yourself worthy or find yourself being made worthy by God. There's a lot of people that stop right there. But the Bible don't. Talk to you about the dangers for a minute of participating in this ceremony unworthy. Because God spells them out pretty clearly. Verse number 29 and 30. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak, and many are sickly among you, and some even sleep. Nobody, nobody, please nobody. Say that Pastor Aaron stood up in front of me and said, I'm sick and I'm weak because I took the Lord's Supper and worthy. God said that. And he clarified with the end that it may not stop there, but many sleep. Many are dead today because they took the Lord's Supper unworthily. See, church, it's important that we cover all this every now and then. It's important that we back up and remember what the message is. That Jesus broke his body and he shed his blood for us. It's important that we remember. What, what the purpose is. And it's important we remember who is allowed to take the Lord's Supper. There's no shame in allowing the plate to pass before you and you not take it. If you're a Christian and you're saved, it is better to not take the Lord's Supper than to take it unworthily. There's two conclusions to this message. The first conclusion is how the Lord's Supper concludes. And I'm not going to take the time to go over and mark and, and read the passage. But when they concluded the Lord's Supper, it says they sang a hymn together and they departed. And every now and then I've had the deacons follow me out at the conclusion of our Lord's Supper. And they departed out and Jesus went out and he went into the Mount of Olives. And that's where he prayed. You want to go back and you want to challenge the Lord's Prayer? What's the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who is art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's a model that he used to teach people to pray. That's not really the Lord's Prayer. You want to, you want to say the Lord had a prayer when you look at the Mount of Olives when he went out that night from the last Passover, when he completed the Lord's Supper. You look at how he fell on his face and he prayed to his God, his Father. The Lord's Supper didn't stop when they walked out because the disciples would go to sleep. And he would come back three times and they would be asleep. But then the world would surround him and take him captive. And they would falsely accuse him. And the sentence that he gave himself out of love for you and I would be carried out. My question in the first conclusion is why, and this, this is going to be pretty good point in life, but if we truly understand that that's what we're memorializing, why do we sing a hymn, have a closing prayer, and then start laughing and cutting up as we leave? I'm not saying everybody, but often we do. Here's my last challenge concerning that. Which one of us will be trained today? Which one of us will walk out the back door after the Lord's Supper and betray? I asked some people this morning, what disciple betrayed Jesus? Or Jesus. Judas. He did. But it was one of them. Just like you and I at the tree. The conclusion of the Lord's Supper should technically never have a conclusion. Because we should constantly be remembering what He's done for us. But the conclusion of this message is simple. We're picking
to go into a time of invitation. And I'm asking you to remember the message, remember the purpose, and remember the requirements. Examine yourself. Correct yourself and prepare yourself for us to worship the greatness of our God by remembering what He does for us on the cross of Calvary. And when we leave this building today, let's leave reverently, prayerfully, <coughs> watching ourselves and guarding ourselves against betraying Him and remaining constantly reminded of how much He loves. Brother James, Miss Marjorie, you'll come. We'll go into our time of invitation. If there's anything God has laid on your heart, please set it. If God has spoken to you,